Uh, great, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Netta Engelhardt from MIT today, and she's going to tell us about free energy from replica wormholes. Take it away, Netta. All right, uh, thank you, Ankur, and thank you everyone for showing up and for the invitation. So I was told this is the uh, thing that stands in place of the usual SITP colloquium. So this, I've aimed to give some background on all of this new, de new developments on the black hole information paradox front, which essentially means that if you're in the field and you have attended any conferences in the past year and a half, you might be a little bit bored in the first uh, 20 minutes of the talk. So uh, if so, feel free to sort of disconnect and I'll get to the more, more current developments about 20 minutes in. Um, okay, so this is based on this is free energy from replica wormholes. This is obviously related to the recent developments on replica wormholes in the black hole information paradox. And it is based primarily on a paper that I wrote with Alex uh, Maloney and Sebastian Fischetti this uh, past summer. And even though I am working on several follow-ups to this, is the Zoom era and everything takes longer, so they're not ready to be discussed. Uh, I, may I may try to say a couple of words at the very end, but I think this talk will really be based on results that have been established. Okay, so let me begin with a little bit of motivation. And, okay, so I'm going to begin with the black hole information paradox because most of that's essentially where all my talks begin these days. So the, here I've drawn a conformal diagram of an evaporating asymptotically flat black hole. For those of you who have not seen a conformal diagram in some time, I'll just remind you that light rays travel at 45 degree angles here. So here we have an event horizon, singularity, and evaporating black hole. And this is meant to be a caricature of the Hawking radiation entangled with the interior. Now, this past year has seen a lot of progress on the black hole information paradox, which of course is an apparent contradiction between the predictions of semi-classical gravity and unitarity of quantum mechanics. Now, the reason that we study the black hole information paradox, of course, is not really for its own sake, but because we hope to learn something about uh, gravity in general from it. When there's a paradox, we understand that that means that the way that we're thinking about a problem must be flawed in some way. And even though we know we don't understand quantum gravity, this is telling us, in some sense, where to look. And I would say one of the things that have been so exciting this past year is that this has started giving us new insight to teach it, that is teaching us more about gravity in general. So it's lived up to the expectation that if we make progress on this in black hole information paradox, then we're going to learn more about gravity in general. So in particular, the inclusion of these exotic topologies in the gravitational path integral, what we're calling the replica wormholes, I would say has shed new light on old insights about Euclidean wormholes and ensembles in gravity, which has been uh, really, really uh, tremendously insightful, I would say. So what I'm going to do today is to set, I'm going to set the stage by reviewing some of these developments. And once I'm done with the review and with the general philosophy, then I'll discuss some of this new work on replica wormholes with Sebastian Fischetti and Alex Maloney. And I should say already at the outset that these are different replica wormholes than the ones that are normally used in the entropy because these are replica wormholes that show up in the free energy or the generating functional, if you prefer. So here's the outline. Unfortunately, the review is going to be a little bit long because I, I'm hoping that if, if somebody's here from a slightly different background that this talk will be accessible. And then I'm going to discuss the replica trick for, free, for the free energy. When, in talking about replica wormholes uh, for the free energy, we mean that there's some kind of a replica trick. And this is a distinct replica trick from the one that we normally use for the von Neumann entropy. So I'll spend a little bit of time discussing this, adi this different additional replica trick. And after that, I'll talk specifically about this replica trick in JT gravity. So one question that might come up for those of you who are familiar with this, with all of this replica wormhole developments is whether this replica trick for the free energy can ever be dominated by uh, replica wormholes. And we do a calculation in JT gravity that shows that it actually can be in a certain uh, low temperature regime. And so I'll, I'll, I won't do the calculation in detail, but I'll hopefully give enough to convince you that we did it correctly. And then there are some very interesting consequences. And so I'll summarize, make some comments. I might make a few, uh, 
a few hints, I might, I might give a few hints as to what I'm working on next, depending on the time. So let me very broadly review some of the developments and the logic and the black hole information paradox. So I'm going to begin just with a lightning review of the uh, of this stage before uh, May 2019. So we imagine we form a black hole from a pure state. So we're considering the entropy of the radiation, so that is the entropy of the quantum fields outside the black hole. We form this from a pure state, so it starts at, at uh, zero entropy. This is entropy as a function of time. And then it increases as the black hole evaporates. And that's okay. Of course, there are two interacting systems, the radiation and the black hole. We expect that the entropy of either one is actually going to increase since they're now part of the system and not the full system. But Hawking's calculation shows that as the black hole continues to evaporate, the entropy of the radiation keeps on increasing. And eventually, when the system is just the radiation, the entropy is much, much larger than it was to start with. And so what we see here is that we, uh, we started out with uh, zero entropy. We ended up in a situation where the radiation is the entire system and its entropy is not zero. So the universe evolves from a pure state to a mixed state, which of course is a violation of unitarity or what we call information loss. So here we have a very funny situation where a pure state in a closed system evolves to a mixed state and information appears to be lost. So the questions that could come up here, maybe quantum gravity is genuinely non-unitary. Maybe there are some non-perturbative corrections that somehow fix this. And you can ask, what does a unitary entropy curve actually look like? So this is the so-called page curve, the unitary curve, which is named after page for proposing it. In this one, the entropy starts out at zero and eventually it ends up at zero. And so when the entropy is the full, when the radiation is the full system, it has the same entropy as it did when we started. Meaning this looks like unitary evolution. At the very least, this is the a sine qua non for uh, unitary evolution. So we can ask which is the correct curve for quantum gravity. I think most of us believe that unitarity is, uh, is part of quantum gravity, so it better be the page curve. But how do we, how do we calculate this curve? So from the perspective of semi-classical gravity, I think it's, I would say it's hard to see where Hawking's analysis goes wrong if you're doing, if you're directly looking at what he did. So it would seem that we need an, an ingredient from quantum gravity to help us figure out where Hawking went wrong, what his calculation was missing. And I would say what we found in the new developments is that a completely semi-classical calculation can give the unitary page curve. So we can see unitarity purely from semi-classical gravity but only if we use an interpretation of the calculation that is inherited from quantum gravity. I would say inherited from holography, or you could say inherited from a particular interpretation of the gravitational path integral. I haven't put that last bit on the slide because it's going to be a big deal for the rest of the talk, so I kind of didn't want to give it away just yet. Okay, so again, for anyone who is not familiar with this, uh, holography is just the duality between quantum gravity with ADS boundary conditions dual to a lower dimensional non-gravitational quantum field theory. In abuse of notation, we call it the boundary, even though it doesn't actually live on the asymptotic boundary. It lives on a space-time that is uh, conformally identical to the asymptotic boundary. And we normally take the limit where quantum gravity becomes semi-classical gravity in this picture, although in principle, it's a duality that works at all couplings. So in ADS CFT, we say a black hole is just another quantum system. And that means that we get unitarity sort of for free. Quantum field theory evolves unitarily, the CFT evolves unitarily, and so ADS CFT tells us that we have unitary black hole evolution, but that's not really satisfactory. We want to understand exactly how that happens. So can ADS CFT help us out in understanding exactly how unitarity is implemented into the gravitational theory? So here's the, the basic idea. Now we already know that if we compute the entropy in the bulk using the usual formula, so the Vonemann entropy of rho bulk is minus trace rho bulk log rho bulk, then we get the Hawking curve, we get information loss. So we compute the entropy on the full Cauchy slice before, on a slice everything outside the horizon during, this is meant to be an evaporating black hole by the way, here it forms from collapse, eventually evaporates, and we have been reevaluated after. So we know, you know that if we compute it this way, then we get, the, we, we get information loss. 
And on the back of the suit can be computed using the CFG, then we say, oh, the unitarity, therefore this evolves, uh, th th there's no information that's lost. So we have these two conflicting answers. And of course we believe the one that's given to us by the CFG. But what we'd like to do is we wanna bridge these two and, and, and compute the CFG answer from using gravitational language. And so the basic idea is to compute the entropy of the boundary, but use the semi-classical bulk using the holographic dictionary that relates boundary entropies to gravitational bulk quantities. And the, what, what happens, what turns out is that a holographic calculation of the entropy in the semi-classical regime using purely semi-classical techniques does in fact yield a unitary page curve. So brief review of holographic entanglement entropy. If you're working purely to zeroth order in GH bar, then we have the Ryu Takinagi or the Hubini Rangamani Takinagi prescription for computing CFT von Neumann entropies from the gravitational bulk. So this is given by the area of an extremal surface over a 4 GH bar, where X here, by extremal, we mean it's a local extremum of the area functional. So if you slightly, uh, you slightly deform its location, then its area doesn't change to leading order in this perturbation. So for example, for a stationary black hole for ADS Schwarzschild, the so-called extremal surface that computes the entropy is the bifurcation surface. It lies on the horizon, it's a sta stationary black hole, its area doesn't change with time. Now, if you want to go to higher orders, the first higher order you might wanna to go to is to include the contribution from quantum fields propagating on a fixed curve background. So you include quantum fields, but you don't include their effect on the metric. So this changes the formula for the holographic entanglement entropy formula. You have to add on an additional term to account for the entropy of the bulk quantum fields. Here we have, the, so here's the extremal surface and we compute the entropy of the bulk quantum fields outside of that surface, that's rho out of x. So this is the state of the quantum fields on the, um, on, in between x and the asymptotic boundary. And, we have to, and here we have to include its contribution. And this entire term here is called the generalized entropy. So again, X hasn't changed. It's still the minimal area extremal surface, but now we've added this contribution. So instead of computing its area over a 4G H bar, we compute its generalized entropy. Now, if we wanted to work to um, basically any other higher order in GH bar, where we consider the effect of quantum fields actually back reacting on the geometry, which is what we want to consider if we're looking at an evaporating black hole, then we have to take a different surface here. So instead of taking the minimal area extremal surface, we take the minimal area, so the minimal, the surface that extremizes this quantity, the generalized entropy. And if there are multiple such surfaces, we pick the one with minimal generalized entropy. So a surface that minimizes this quantity, the generalized entropy, we call the quantum extremal surface. And again, if there's more than one, then we pick the one that minimizes the generalized entropy. Where again, here we have some quantum extremal surface and we evaluate its generalized entropy on a Cauchy slice, or if your space-time is not strictly globally hyperbolic on a, on a time slice, where this here is the state of the quantum fields outside of this quantum extremal surface, chi. Yeah, so this is the lightning review of the, uh, of the holographic entanglement entropy. Okay, so, what did uh, these new developments show? Well, the initial results found that if you force an ADS black hole to evaporate by coupling it to an external reservoir, then if you just use the standard minus trace row long row formula for the bulk, you'll find information loss. But if you use the quantum extremal surface prescription, then you actually do get a unitary page curve. And so the quantum extremal surface prescription gives you the correct unitary answer even though you only need to use semi-classical quantities in that prescription. So the, uh, the main takeaway, and again, I really don't want to spend a lot of time on this, is that the, you get a new branch of quantum extremal surfaces that uh, dominates at late times. And as a result of that, you essentially get the, um, the unitary part, the unitary page curve. So it's, it's it's critical that you have this new quantum extremal surface that nucleates and dominates at late times. All right, so this is, this is most of the, of the background. Now let's, let's take a step back for a minute. What happened here? We took a purely semi-classical formula 
area and entropy of quantum fields, this is completely, this is, this is perturbative. And we have not used anything but non-perturbative quantum gravity here. In particular, the state rho out is exactly the state that would go into the Hawking formula. That would give us a non-unitary answer, but somehow we've corrected it so that this entire quantity here, again, computed semi-classically, is giving us unitary. Now, the only place that quantum gravity appeared is in the interpretation of this generalized entropy here, this thing, as the entropy of the radiation. And so the immediate question that we're going to ask in, in seeing this, uh, this, the fact that we can reproduce the semi-classical, can reproduce uni the unitary answer using semi-classical physics, is what microscopic physics justifies the quantum extremal surface prescription? Right now, this is just kind of a, an automaton that gives us the right answer when we feed it something, but we want to understand why. That was the whole point of this exercise, is to understand the gravitational mechanism that gives rise to unitarity. So I could ask a naive question here? Yes, please. So, so I'm one of the, maybe the few people here that this review is intended for. I have not followed the subject. So my question is, is naive. And, and it's just, what, what is the role of coupling to an external bath? You might have thought that if you did everything super carefully in conventional ADS-CFT, um, there would be a prescription that works there. So, so why do we need the external bath, which enlarges the system in some other way? Um, because large ADS black holes don't evaporate. So we, we have a bit of a conservation of misery situation where we don't really understand small ADS black holes and large ADS black holes don't evaporate. So we have to force it to evaporate. And the way that we can do this is to couple it to an ex external system. Uh, so you're coupling to an external system with lower temperature and then the larger. Exactly. The external oh, system is a, it is a, so we, with, uh, with Ahmed, Don, and Henry, we did this in, uh, very explicitly in JT gravity, where we, act, we, have, we had a, a CFT that was in the ground state. Uh, and so it, it's, it's at lower temperature. And so the black hole essentially evaporates into the, uh, the external system. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, well, sorry. Can I ask a question? I, Please. Um, I do go to these meetings, but I'm slow, so I, I'm going to ask the question anyway. So, um, when you say that the gravitational calculation should explain the details of information transfer, I get confused by that statement. Here's why: like, if you think about the older stuff, say with the um, calculation of the entropy of a black hole, the black hole thermodynamics and all that uh, in terms of the area of the horizon and some of the dynamics of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that fits with, you know, thermodynamics in non-trivial ways, but it's not the same as a microstate count, as we all know. Instead, that was provided in other ways, D1, D5, and so on. So um, in what sense, this page curve thing is beautiful, but it, it, should we leap to the conclusion that it's got inside of it the answer to the detailed information transfer or, or is that too quick? Maybe that's where you're going, but. So, so um, I, I, it's, it's a great question. It's kind, it's kind of uh, preempting where I'm going, yes. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about is work partly from Stanford of um, trying to justify this using the gravitational path integral. And so in that sense, it's very parallel to the developments on the, uh, on the entropy of black holes. Well, so, so I, yeah, I'm, of course, aware of that and um, admire that work quite a bit, but I think that if I understood correctly, that doesn't claim to give the information transfer mechanism in real time either. No, not at all. This so is that. Uh, so the, the end goal is something, is a place that I, we have not gotten to. Uh, okay. we have not, I would say we have not resolved this problem. We okay, are, it, yeah. it's on the horizon, we're, we're, if you'll pardon the pun, and we're going there. Um, but we have not reached that. I would say that we have not reached that point yet, but clearly since this is computing a unitary answer, we want to sort of take it apart to try to understand better why it is giving us that answer. Definitely, yeah. It's just that it's not implying that its ingredients are the full answer to the-, to the Absolutely answer. not, no, no. I mean, part of the reason we, we looked into this uh, replica one holes into free energy is because it doesn't actually give you the, the, the answer. It just tells you in some sense where you should be looking. Uh, so uh, as th that was a perfect segue. Thank you, Eva. Um, so what? So let's ask then. What? How do we justify this uh, this formula so that we can understand better what are the ingredients in the gravitational path integral? So I say, what are the ingredients that uh, in this calculation that um, that give us unitarity? What is the gravitational mechanism that is responsible for this formula working so beautifully? 
So the, the, this was uh, tackled by two groups, two papers that appeared at the same time. This appeared to be a bit of a theme in, this, uh, in these recent developments. Uh, the so-called East Coast and West Coast models that were uh, essentially toy models for trying to, uh, to give a derivation of this result, in particular of the, of the derivation of the entropy of the Hawking radiation of the unitarity that as given by the quantum extremal surface or the so-called quantum extremal island um, prescription. And so for my purposes today, the East Coast model is going to be a little bit more uh, instructive. So I, I do realize, I try, so I tried to make an effort and write this talk in terms of the West Coast model because I'm talking to the West Coast group here, but uh, that was, uh, that proved to be difficult. Um, so for pedagogical reasons, I'll stick to the East Coast model here. So in this model, essentially, um, I think I have one more slide on this, yeah. So in this model, what is essentially going on is that you have an ADS2 here. So this is all in 2D gravity. And you have this, uh, this is attached to a flat region here, which is acting the part of the external reservoir that I mentioned earlier. And this ca a calculation is then being, is then done, which is uh, essentially directly computing the von Neumann entropy using the replica trick. So not using minus trace rho log rho in Lorentzian time, but using the, uh, the, gra the gravitational replica trick. So let me remind, let me review that because this is actually replica tricks will be essential for the rest of this talk. So the nth many entropy of some rho r. So rho r is some uh, some state. Here I'm not talking about any about gravity at all. This is just uh, standard quantum field theory. Um, so here we can define the uh, many entropy of some rho sub r as uh, one. It's defined one over one minus n log trace rho r to the n. And we can compute the von Neumann entropy by taking the n goes to one limit of this formula. Now, if we work in Euclidean signature, and essentially for the rest of this talk, I'll be working in Euclidean signature, which I'm a relativist, so that's kind of, a, it's a big step for me to be working in Euclidean signature. Uh, so working in Euclidean signature, we can, uh, we can write the state in terms of the Euclidean partition function. And though if we, so if we just rewrite this in this, in this formula, in terms of the Euclidean partition function, we get this formula right here, where z of b is the partition function on the space b, which for us would be the boundary manifold, and z of b sub n is a partition function on b sub n, which is an n-sheeted geometry that consists of n copies of b that are cut along r, so r here is some boundary subregion, and then they're cyclically identified along r. So here is a picture. So again, this is going to be cyclically cut along R and cyclically identified along it. I didn't actually draw that this is the cyclic identification. So this is just a standard replica trick if we're working in a Euclidean signature. Now, in a very beautiful and seminal paper, Lefkowitz and Maldacena translated this into, the, into a gravitational replica trick. The idea here is to replace the partition function Z by the gravitational path integral. So we replace z of b by what we're going to call p of b, which is the gravitational path integral with boundary conditions b. And similarly, we replace z of b sub n, this n-sheeted uh, manifold, by p of b sub n. So this is the gravitational path integral where the boundary conditions are given by b sub n. So for example, in the East Coast model, the identified region r is not actually in the gravitational region. So the gravitational path integral is over just n copies of the ADS boundary. They're, they're identified in the non-gravitational region. So, so this is the, uh, these, these would be the replicas of the East Coast paper. B here is the, is the ADS boundary. So subsequent developments, deriving this quantum extremal island, quantum extremal surface formula. So in general, P of B to the N, so this is N copies of B. Again, since we're not identifying the region in the gravitational, uh, gravitational region, then this is just N copies of the boundary manifold B. So in general, P of B to the N is going to be some P of B raised to the power N plus connected topologies. So things like this don't factorize, and so they go into this second term here. Now, this is not exactly news, uh, whether Connected topologies should be included or not has been is a subject that has been discussed in the past. 
And it was found by this East and West Coast groups that after the page time or the analog in this Euclidean picture, the contribution from these connected topologies dominates. And this is exactly what corresponds to this, this jump in the quantum extremal surface, the fact that the connected topologies dominate over the disconnected ones. Now, should the topologies be included, these exotic topologies? Well, sorry. These, yeah. Uh, was there an accurate picture of the wormhole? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, was the picture of the wormhole in the, uh, that you showed an accurate one of the solution? Oh, sorry, I'm going to turn up the volume. I can barely hear you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, the picture of the wormhole you showed? Yeah. Is that what it actually looks like? Is that what? The He's asking if this is actually a plot of a solution. I think he was worried about how narrow it was. So, so um, if this is, if, is, this, is this a solution? So is this on shell? So here we're talking about the, if you're talking in terms of the West Coast group, for example, you're talking about the full uh, gravitational path integral. The East Coast group worked around um, the end goes to one saddle and did a perturbative expansion there. So it depends on whether you believe that perturbative expansion or not. Oh, Ned, I think the question was about the specific figure you've drawn and whether that is what the solution actually looks like. Oh, um, no, this is meant to be just for illustrative purposes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm glad I got to explain one other thing, so. Um, all right. So we want to include these exotic topologies because they result in a unitary page curve. Um, but including them, of course, means that the gravitational path integral over n copies of the boundary does not, uh, is not equal to the gravitational path over that one copy raised to the power n. And so if we literally take the gravitational path integral to be computing the partition function, then we find that z of b to the n is not equal to z of b raised to the power n. And this is very uncomfortable because, well, if these are n independent copies of the same system, then really this partition function should be factorizing. Now, one possible, again, this, this issue has been long discussed in the literature. And one possibility that has long been discussed is that the gravitational path integral computes an ensemble average. It's not the only possibility. And that would resolve this issue. It's not the only possibility. Another possibility is that you have some non-perturbative corrections that restore factorization, or maybe the gravitational path integral is just a really good tool for computing quantities that are self-averaging in a single chaotic theory. Um, I am not going to subscribe to any particular interpretation here. I'm going to be agnostic on whether the gravitational path integral is ensemble averaging or not. I wanted to sort of lay on the table that there are multiple ways of trying to explain this, uh, this particular phenomenon. Sorry, if, if yeah. the possibility that was realized was that non-perturbative corrections restore factorization so you could actually describe a product field theory, then what happens to the resolution um, of obtaining the page curve from, the, from this prescription? Right, so we could say, well, we could say that um, these factors, non-perturbative corrections are sort of um, averaged out in a, something like a, in a self-averaging quantity so we don't actually necessarily see them or need them when we compute the entropy. But when you're computing something that's more fine-grained, you, you would be seeing these non-perturbative corrections. Of course, a resolution like this has to be careful that it restores factorization without destroying what we have seen already, so without destroying the unitarity of the page curve. So I, you could say, oh, that seems a little bit fine-tuned. I would say we haven't ruled it out, though. So you're saying the corrections would depend on the precise microstate and what you're computing is averaging over microstates and they cancel there? I, I, I don't want to, to make a commitment to what these non-perturbative corrections would be, but I would argue that they, so they, they to me, they seem, it seems like they probably would have to be fine-tuned, yes. But I think that there are people who probably would disagree with me on this. Any other questions? All right. So even though I'm going to be agnostic on whether the gravitational path integral is ensemble averaging or not, I just want to make an aside here, a comment on, uh, on, on averaging. So normally when we say an ensemble or disorder average, uh, what we mean is we have this partition function z sub g, which is defined with respect to some choice of coupling constants, which are sampled from a distribution. And then this average is computing this integral here. Now, if this is what the gravitational path integral is computing in gravity, it's not obvious what an individual z sub g of b is. 
Uh, again, this is just an aside, but this is a question that I am interested in, have thought about, and would love to hear comments from the audience on. But again, this is an aside. I'm not going to subscribe to any particular interpretation of the gravitational path integral in this talk. So a few questions. If we want to take the replica wormhole seriously, which I'm of the opinion that we do, then we need to understand better what kind of calculation the gravitational path integral is doing. Is it averaging? Is it uh, computing? Is it just a really good approximation to some self-averaging quantity? If it is averaging, what is it averaging over? What are the implications of this behavior of the gravitational path integral on other observables? Can we see signatures of this averaging or whatever it is the gravitational path integral is doing on something beyond the Rennie entropies? So for instance, we might ask whether something primitive like the generating functional log z or the free energy minus t log z is sensitive to these contributions from the replica wormholes if this, this nature of the gravitational path integral that we don't understand is impacting those other observables. And so finally, this leads me to bullet two, which is the replica trick for the free energy. So let's talk about computing log z. I'm going to use free energy and log z interchangeably. Uh, I guess I could say the generating functional, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so if the gravitational path integral does receive contributions from connected topologies, then in principle, it's possible that there's a big difference between log z bar versus bar log z. Now, what do I mean by this? Bar just means whatever it is that the gravitational path integral is doing, whether it's ensemble averaging or something else. So log of the gravitational path integral that is approximate, that is computing something like z versus a direct calculation of log z, basically if this is ensemble averaging, an average over log z. So in condensed matter systems, this first quantity is called the annealed free energy, and it computes an average over the random variables that define a particular instance of an ensemble. Now, this is suggestive of an interpretation as degenerating functional in a theory in which random variables are allowed to equilibrate. The second one is called a quenched free energy, and it computes an average over free energies of constituents of the ensemble. So in other words, where the random variables are not allowed to equilibrate. And this second one is, it seems like what we want. Even if the gravitational path integral is not computing on ensemble average, whatever it is that it is computing, it seems clear that the thing that we care about is doing this computing log z, if it is an average, something like an average over log z. Now, if this z of b to the n computed by the gravitational path integral is not the same as the of b computed by the gravitational path integral raised to the power n, then we might also expect that log of z computed by the gravitational path integral is not the same as log of z computed by the gravitational path integral. So how can we make sense of this quantity is log of z computed from the gravitational path integral? Really, we only know how to compute uh, z of b and z of b to the n using the gravitational path integral. And this is where the, another replica trick comes in to help us. So we can compute log z via a replica trick. In fact, condensed meta theorists have been doing this for decades, where all we have to do is we take log z here and we have this new replica trick, which is different from our old replica trick. So here we take a limit m goes to zero. I'm always going to use m for the replicas for log z and n for the replicas for the von Neumann entropy. So here we have one over m, z of b to the m minus one. And so this z of b to the m is something we can't compute from the gravitational path integral. And so we find that we actually can compute this averaged or whatever it is the gravitational path integral is doing log of z from this replica trick. So Let's talk about this log z replica trick. If replica wormholes can contribute non-trivially to the log z replica trick in the m goes to zero limit, then the quenched free energy, which is this object, is going to be very different from the annealed free energy, which is this log of p of b. So this one would only receive contributions from disconnected topologies, and this one would be able to receive contributions from the connected topologies. 
So in principle, we can have these, these two can give two very different answers. So let's, uh, let's see an example where this works. So if we suppose we wanted to compute the average von Neumann entropy, well, actually, if you remember the formula, we had a log Z in there, which means that if we strictly were to compute it correctly, we would have to have a compounded replica trick. One for computing the von Neumann entropy, so these are the n replicas, and one for computing the, just the logarithm that goes into this formula. So here I was careful and put an overbar over the logarithm, where before we were careful and did not do that. So the correct formula for, log, for the von Neumann entropy of rho r, if in, given that we have now an understanding that the gravitational path integral does not simply compute z, but compute some, some, something like an average over z, is this two replica trick, one with n replicas and one with m replicas. So the entire replicated manifold looks like this mess here, where you have these n replicas that are all identified, uh, cyclically identified, and cut along R. And then you have M copies of that. So this is the replicated manifold B sub N to the M. And so really when you're computing von Neumann entropies in gravity, you actually have to be doing two replica tricks rather than one. Now, does this actually matter? Well, there's one case where we can sort of obviously see that it's important to include this additional replica trick. Let's suppose we do something boring and we compute the von Neumann entropy for a pure state. If we don't use the log z replica trick, then we find this answer here. We have log of p sub b, p of b, p of b sub n minus n log p of b. Now, if replica wormholes contribute at any order, then this would not exactly cancel and this will not vanish identically for a pure state. State. Because again, for a pure state, we are, we, we're not cutting along R, we're just taking the entire system. And so this is not going to vanish identically for a pure state. And so we'll get that maybe it is zero to leading order, but it's not going to be zero identically. Now, if we actually use the log Z replica trick, then for a pure state, we'll have B sub N to the M is just going to be B N M. And we can rewrite this formula in this way where here m tilde is just nm. And plugging this back in, we find that this thing is actually identically zero. So we don't have to know any details about any non-perturbative physics to just say, as long as we include this additional replica trick, we know that the von Neumann entropy of a pure state is going to be identically zero, which of course is exactly what we want. Now, it is true that this is a subleading correction. So it is possible that we might say, well, okay, but maybe these replica wormholes in the, uh, in the free energy or in this additional compounded replica trick really only contribute at subleading orders. So while they're interesting, are they really that interesting? Do they really give us the same kind of very violent signature that the replica wormholes for the page curve did? Uh, so can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't understand what do you mean by order? Is order in what? When, um, when so at subleading orders, for instance. Right. So suppose that there are, that there are these replica wormholes in the free energy do not dominate the calculation. So the calculation is given. So the, the, you can approximate the log z. So if you can approximate this um, average log z as the annealed one log of the average of z plus some subleading corrections. Then you would not, you would say, oh, this is more or less correct, but you know, you may have some, maybe some non-perturbative corrections that you don't really worry about. Even though this should be identically zero, so, but we, you might not be bothered by the fact that it's not identically zero because the corrections come in at higher orders. Because th these wormholes are, are suppressed by uh, say in JT gravity or suppressed by EDS naught. So I should think of the subleading orders as being uh, suppressed by e to the minus. Well, you would usually you would say suppressed by e to the minus s the entropy. Sure. But then when you have a purest state, I don't know they are suppressed. By so I'm going to be uh, very precise and how the, how these new topologies 
contribute and in what order in JT gravity in just a couple of minutes. So um, why don't you hold on to that question and see if that answers what you're asking. Okay, thanks. Other questions? All right. So if we're just computing log Z, we don't have to have this whole mess because we don't have these N replicas. In fact, we only have the M replicas. And since we're going to be working in, uh, in, with ADS boundary conditions, we're not gonna worry about the flat region. We just have M copies of uh, ADS boundary conditions. Okay, so what we want to ask is the following question. Is there a simple theory of gravity? with a regime where replica wormholes contribute to log Z at least as much as the disconnected topologies. Because that's a signature that we can't ignore. That might actually tell us if we're looking at something like, that tell us more, but whether we're looking at something like ensemble averaging. Now in JT gravity, and I should say also in some other cases, there have been studies, numerous studies, of the lack of factorization due to contribution of connected topologies to PB raised to the power M. Now, if you just hear that, then you say, okay, well, this, the answer is obvious. If these, uh, if these contribute, if the topologies contribute, and they contribute at least as much as the disconnected topologies, then obviously they also contribute to this term here, and uh, at least as much as the disconnected topologies do. But there's a subtle and important point here, which is that we take the M goes to zero analytic continuation. And that turns out to have some pretty interesting physics. So, Finally, I get to talk about free energy in JT gravity. We also did a calculation in CGHS, but I'm going to just stick to JT gravity for brevity here. So I know that in, in general, I find that there are two different uh, types of audience members, or at least two different types of audience members, some who want to see the detailed calculations and some who would really just see the big picture. In an effort to cater to both types um, and anybody in between, I'm going to first give a bit overview on what the basic upshot of this is, and then I'll go a little bit more into the technical details. So what is the big picture here? What do we see? So we actually do find that replica wormholes give a larger contribution to log Z than disconnected topologies at low temperatures. And in fact, if you don't, if you didn't know about any of this and you just calculated the free energy using just the disconnected topologies, in other words, you calculate the annealed free energy, then you would find a pathological answer. You would find something that is non-monotonic with temperature, and so it gives you a negative entropy somewhere. So even if we didn't have the context of replica wormholes in the Bonhomme entropy, we would already know that this is not the full story. Now, the pathological behavior, this non-monotonicity, that prima facie appears to be mitigated by the inclusion of replica wormholes. Now, what does that mean? It means it's not as bad. The non-monotonicity appears to be getting flatter and flatter, but because we're not able to do the calculation uh, fully analytically, and I'm going to say more about that in a minute, it's not obvious that this is actually going to be sufficient. Even with this, sort of we do a partial inclusion of replica wormholes, and I'll be much clearer on what that means later, and a resummation of genus, the free energy appears to be non-monotonic with temperature which is again, very pathological. So it's possible we just need to do a full inclusion of replica wormholes, maybe that fixes the problem. But one thing that can easily go wrong is the analytic continuation itself. This M goes to zero analytic continuation is in fact non-unique. There's a lot of freedom in how to do this and the obvious or simple analytic continuations are just clearly wrong. They're giving us a wrong answer. And this is, very interesting because it has parallels to replica symmetry breaking in spin glass systems. These require a similar computation of the free energy, of the quenched free energy. So if you just do compute the disconnected topology contributions, you find a very, very pathological behavior, this non-monotonic with temperature. You can include the replica wormholes and it's mitigated, but it doesn't fix it. And then in a very novel analytic continuation, which is basically the Parisian sort, is what fixes it altogether. So that suggests that there's maybe some parallel here with spin glass systems. So the big takeaway I would say here is that there, at least in some low dimensional theories of gravity, there exists at least one regime in which replica wormholes make a large contribution to log Z. And this is what helps you avoid various pathologies. 
And this also requires a non-trivial analytic continuation. It has parallels to spin glasses. This is the big takeaway, but there are a lot of subtleties in here and a lot of interesting points that I'm now going to talk about. Can I ask another question now? Yeah. So, so if you've concluded that here replica wormholes have to be important to get a non-pathological answer, mm -hmm. um, what breaks down in the expansion of an attempt to compute holographically the free energy of a, of a product conformal field theory? Um, so if you wanted, if you were to try to compute using, uh, if you just, just said, I'm, I want to use the CFT, I want to compute the entropy of the CFT, and I want to do, use the bulk to do it, essentially is what you're asking? That's what I'm asking. Um, yeah, so this is, this is touching upon something that I'm uh, currently working on, which is actually trying to do some kind of a uh, lefkowitz moldesena type calculation of the replica trick for the free energy. Um, now, that I think that maybe that's not exactly what you're asking. I think what you're asking is essentially we can compute, we can try to compute the Neumann entropy of n equals four super Young mills just looking at the um, the Euclidean action. And th this is, I think, related to the issue of averaging in, in say higher dimensions, where um, I don't think we know. At least I know I don't understand how that works for. Um, in, in these higher dimensional theories. I don't know what averaging means when we know that ADS, uh, AD, ADS5 is gonna be dual to n equals four super Young mills. So I, I, I would say I don't have an answer in general in higher dimensions. I think in, uh, in JT gravity, well, we're looking at a regime that you say, you might say doesn't necessarily have a CFT dual, but in general, you could imagine that this involves some kind of an average over coupling. I don't know if this completely addressed your question though. Uh, uh, it's very closely related. I, I guess what's confusing me is I would have thought that the, the sum over saddles is a principled thing, at least in some sense. And so that you can quantify the size of corrections you're missing. And what you're telling me is there has to be a huge correction to the dominant saddle in the computation of the free energy for the product CFT. And I don't see where there's room for such a huge correction. Yeah, so, so I, should, I should make one thing clear here, which is that here, when we work with JT gravity, we don't actually work within the saddle point approximations, so we're including the full gravitational path integral. Uh, the second, I think it's, it's essentially the same question of, it's issue of factorization, right? Now, why is it the gravitational path integral appears to have this connected topology that we want to include, even though the CFT appears to factorize? So this is one of the motivations for looking into this, because if we try to do a bulk computation of the free energy, maybe a naive one that doesn't do the replica trick, and we find that it gives us a pathological free energy, if, if we're treating the CFTs as two decoupled systems, then uh, if we have two CFTs and we're treating this as two decoupled systems, then I think we have a problem in the dictionary in terms of what the gravitational path integral is computing, which, which is exactly what, where we're hoping to go with this, is to understand better what is the gravitational path integral computing so that we don't run into a, some kind of a contradiction with what the CFTs are calculating. Thank you. Hi, Neda. Yeah. Hi. So you asked this another way, what Shamut was asking. So mm -hmm. these pathologies that you mentioned, you said those are at low temperatures, right? Yes. Uh, what are those temperatures? Are they like yeah. one over so I'm going to go through the calculation in, a, in more detail now. So if this is a calculation about the, is the question about the details? Just hold on to it for another minute or two because the next uh, next we're going to into some detail. Exactly what temperature is what what, what we're looking at. Um, so I, I, I'm really enjoying the fact that the questions are always giving me segues into, uh, into the next slide. Thank you all for that. Uh, so let's take a look at the calculation in a bit more detail. So we're, we work with JT gravity, which uh, here's the Euclidean action for JT gravity. And we are doing a, this path integral over geometries that connect M boundaries, all of which have length uh, beta. This was done by Sadshanker Stanford. And they have this beautiful formula for the path integral that again connects m boundaries of length beta. Here, this z g, g comma m is a function of the volume and moduli space of constant negative curvature spaces with m boundaries and genus g. So these are polynomials in beta, and they have this order. So this is the basic setup, and again, we relied very heavily on the Saad Shanker Stanford paper. All right, so. Let's, uh, let, let's just parse this a little bit. So this here is, uh, we can write down this P, this connect, the gravitational path integral that connects two boundaries. As, uh, so we have this, this trumpet, and then we have this, uh, this higher genus corrections to the trumpet, for example. 
Now, the connected topologies are suppressed at large S0. So I think this is beginning to answer some of the earlier questions. And you can do a simple analysis. And you can show that at low temperatures, the, the connected topologies are going to compete with the disks, basically at beta 3 halves e to the minus S0. It goes basically being order 1. So Milin, I don't know if this answers your question, but the temperatures that we are looking at, this is the low temperature regime that we're looking at. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I suspect that the concern that you were going to raise is that you appear to need this main parameter in the problem, beta, to be non-perturbatively large in S0. So you might have two concerns here. You uh, might Nana, say, could, could I, so, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, maybe in a, just wanted to offer an interpretation of that temperature. It's, the point Actually, where the number of states that are contributing to the partition function significantly is of order one. So this is a region where the partition function is really small and it, it's not like you need a huge, it's not like it implies there's large corrections to the physics. It's just a region where there's hardly any states contributing at all to begin with. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so you might have a couple of concerns about, uh, about this regime. So you might worry that the connected topologies can only dominate in a regime that requires non-perturbative physics. That's one option. But I would say this is really no different from the phenomenon entropy case where you, the size of the Hilbert space of the radiation had to compete with E to the S0. So again, you had to have this non, some parameter had to be non-perturbatively large in S0. You might also say, well, the genus expansion is asymptotic at low temperatures. And it turns out that there actually is a small separation of scales here there's an intermediate regime where the connected topologies quote unquote dominate, which is to say they contribute more than the disconnected ones, even though we're not doing a solid point approximation. And the temperatures are not so low that the genus expansion is out of control. And uh, in fact, thanks to Douglas, we also looked at the so-called airy limit where you can actually sum the genus expansion exactly. And we found that this, uh, our results were robust in that limit. So what were the, the results? Let's first talk about the annealed free energy and what goes wrong there. So the free energy that is computed purely from disconnected topologies, basically if you didn't know about the replica wormholes and you didn't use the replica trick to compute the Van entropy, you would find that it is non-monotonic in temperature. So what is going on here is these blue lines are partial sums of the genus expansion. So progressively larger genus as we go down and I'll talk about the red curve in a minute. So Again, this is non-monotonic, and since F, S is equal to minus df dt, that means a negative entropy somewhere, which is, of course, unphysical. Now, let's get a little bit more technical. So you might worry that you know, this is a very low temperature regime, and you look at the partial sums, and you say, well, can I really trust anything that's going on here? Well, if you actually look where the non-monotonicity is uh, over here, is, you can actually say, well, you, have, you can do a this partial sum analysis, and in the partial sum analysis, you can see that even though at very low temperatures, the expansion is poorly behaved, there is this intermediate regime over here where the asymptotic series is under control in the sense that it gives us a, a bound on what the actual series is doing, uh, what the actual sum is doing. And the partial sums are expected to be a good approximation for what the series is actually doing. So because we have non-monotonicity in this regime, we expect that it is actually robust against the resummation of the genus expansion. Now, we can also talk about the airy case. So if S0 is large and we're holding TE to the 2S0 over 3 fixed, then it turns out you can actually exchange the asymptotic genus expansion for an expansion in low temperatures. I believe this was actually done in the SSS paper. And that you can sum exactly. And that's exactly what this curve over here is which of course is extremely non-monotonic. You have the same type of non-monotonicity here that you did in the partial sums. So depending on which approach you favor, it seems that we see that the maximum of up here is robust against adding higher genera. So we say, all right, so there's, there's this, the, the annealed free energy just appears to be very pathological. So we know there's another way of computing the uh, annealed free energy, the, the free energy, and that is the quench free energy. So unfortunately, we cannot compute this as an analytic function of m, which is what we would need to do in order to take the m goes to zero limit. And the reason that we can't do that is because these ZGMs are not known as analytic functions of m. There's, just, there's an iterative expansion for them, but we, they're actually not known as analytic functions. 
What we can do instead is define a truncated path integral, which we called PM comma capital M, which connects up to capital M boundaries via an iterative procedure. So for example, P12 comma four is going to include up to four connected uh, topologies. So uh, topologies, topologies connecting up to four boundaries. So that's this one here. And then it's going to be getting contributions from all of the lower ones that can contribute. So in other words, you have the situation where all of them are connecting four boundaries, where these are connecting four boundaries, and these are connecting three, and so on. So, is that, so we com computed this, and this gives us a, this so-called truncated path integral. And the, by this definition, the quenched phi energy is this limit, m goes, the capital M goes to infinity, little m goes to zero, of this one over m, p little m comma big M minus one. Now, we can't take the m goes to infinity limit, again, for the same reason that we couldn't take the little m goes to zero limit, um, because we don't have an analytic, analytic form for the ZGMs. But for a given capital M, we can actually analytically continue to little m goes to zero. So here are the different curves of the free energy for different values of capital M. And we went up to m equals five. You can, uh, you can sort of keep on going. It's a little bit computationally expensive. It takes a long time for this code to run. But uh, let's, let's, let's take a look at this. So here we have the blue curve. This is just m equals one, which is the annealed free energy. And you can see that even on the m equals two, it looks a little funny as you go to progressively larger m, it appears to be smoothening out a little bit, but it's not clear that including progressively larger capital M's will save us. We, we can't actually tell if the maximum here is really getting smaller or if it's robust. So again, we're only doing this at finite M. If you think M equals five is large enough to read the behavior at M goes to infinity, then this is concerning. Um, otherwise, maybe you wouldn't be so worried. You would say, I assume it'll be fine as we go to M goes to infinity. All right, Nana, can I ask a, 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 sorry, this may have been more uh, useful in the big picture part, but there seems to be an underlying assumption here that thermodynamics should work in this system. And maybe this is sort of what you're getting at with some of the questions before, but. Um, you mean that, that you and B shouldn't trust uh, the relation between F and S? Yeah, I'm trying to understand how we know that we're in a thermodynamic limit of that sort in this system that's really been boiled down to, if I understand you're doing the JT gravity, which is like a tiny number of degrees of freedom just in itself. So how, how do we know that we're in some sort of thermodynamic limit? I might be missing the point, but I'm confused. I'd say we don't know for a fact. Uh, I, I, would, I would say because we're working in Euclidean gravity, we sort of always expect that there's some kind of a thermodynamic interpretation. Uh, you bring up a good point. I will, however, give an example of a condensed matter system that behaves exactly the same way and where we can actually trust that, that it's thermodynamic, but it behave, it has the same kind of funny behavior. So, so in, that system, in that system, there will be some analog of the, of the whole Euclidean quantum gravity story or? Sorry, that was good. I just I missed the, the very first part of what you said. Well, I'll, I'll just wait, but I'm, conf I'm curious how how these uh, wormholes and whatnot will enter into such a condensed matter system. They, they enter as correlations between replicas that uh, appear in some sense spontaneously uh, at low temperatures. Yeah. When I say condensed matter system, I mean spin glasses. That's where we're going to see this. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just, just to reiterate the general question once more, and then I'll stop the, you know, um, in other cases where we know the thermodynamic interpretation works out, it also, um, goes along with, you know, something like D1D5 or whatever, the, the, the thing where there are lots of degrees of freedom underlying it, um, and in some situations we can even count what those are. Not to say there aren't here, but it, it does seem to be an assumption in this whole thing that that should have worked, that there's a pathology because uh, we didn't see the normal thermodynamic behavior here. And, and well, you, right, so you, you can take two different approaches here. You can either say there's a pathology, so clearly this computes the wrong answer. Um, or you can say, well, we learned from the page curve that we need to take replica wormholes seriously, so let's see what they do. And you find that they actually contribute more than the disconnected uh, topologies. So if you just base your intuition on that, you would say, well, we should include them anyways. Um, so it, the, the thermodynamic analogy here is meant to, uh, to sort of motivate why you might have wanted to do this, even if you didn't know about what we know now about replica wormholes. 
Right, right. I guess I'm addressing the part that didn't quite the residual issue that you're getting at. But let me let me stop and wait to see what, what more you want to say. Well, let me know if if I don't address it at the end, we can have an interesting discussion. Yeah. Hi, Neda. Sorry, one yeah. more question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is small m always greater than capital M? From the previous picture, it seemed that small m is greater than capital M. It is what always bigger than capital M? Small m? If you go to the previous slide. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what is small is, m? That's right. Small m has to be bigger than capital M. Okay, good. So once you, you calculate that for fixed M and capital M, then you take the limit M going to zero and capital M going to infinity. So uh, yeah, we can't actually calculate capital M going to infinity. So we, yeah. yeah. So in a way, you really haven't taken the third dynamic limit yet, right? As in all the issues of the thermodynamic limit existing or not actually depends upon whether you can take capital M. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get to not. that right now. I'm going to get to the analytic condition right now. Um, okay. I keep on telling you the next slide. I'm sorry about that, but the next slide literally is going to be the next one. At least I think it's the next slide. If not, it's going to be the one after that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. It is the next slide. Okay. So here are two different analytic continuations of, um, of little m goes to zero. Now, quantitatively, qualitatively they look similar, but quantitatively they're different. And the fact that we have two different analytic continuations that are both equally legitimate, or equally valid, is, uh, is somewhat concerning. Normally, we justify the replica trick by arguing in some way or other that the entropy is, uh, that, the, that the replica trick is, gives you an, an analytic continuation which is unique. And here it's manifestly not the case. So let's talk a little bit about this non-uniqueness of the analytic continuation. We know that this quenched free energy in the two different analytic continuations, these two here, is, is not correct. Um, it's probably not correct because we chose the wrong analytic continuation, unless you think that taking the, M, the capital M goes to infinity limit is going to fix things. Maybe it will, but if you don't think it's going to fix things, then it looks like the other thing that can go wrong here is the analytic continuation. And the reason that both of these are, have this non-monotonicity is that we just took the wrong analytic continuation in both cases. So not only have we learned that replica wormholes have to contribute here in the sense that in two senses, either you believe this thermodynamic story or you just say, well, they contribute to the von Neumann entropy. So if they're dominating in this case in the free energy, then they better contribute to the free energy. But they also have to do this in a very non-trivial way via some sort of analytic continuation that without any kind of top-down derivation, we're just going to have to try and guess. Now, some of you who work with the replica trick on a regular basis might be wondering what goes, what's going, what about Carlson's theorem? So Carlson's theorem is normally used to justify uniqueness of, analytic, of the analytic continuation in the replica trick. Essentially, so here's the statement of the theorem. Um, one of the assumptions that goes into it is that this, it's, they have this, this function grows no faster than exponentially in Z in the right half plane, in the complex half right half plane. Now, in our case, this is not true. We have a super exponential increase. And so Carlson's theorem does not apply. Now this is not, it is not sufficient to guarantee that we don't have a unique analytic continuation, but of course we already know that we don't. This is more of an aside for those of you who are wondering what, why didn't we just, why didn't we look at Carlson's theorem? We did, it doesn't work, it doesn't help us. So let's talk a little bit about this analytic continuation. I would say that finding the correct analytic continuation is clearly really important for understanding what the gravitational path integral is doing. The, the fact that there's a non-unique analytic continuation and there's some distinguished choice that gives us the correct answer, is, it suggests that this, this is inherited in some sense from some, maybe some UV completion of gravity. Now, I'm, I promised a few words about spin glasses. There's a very similar story in spin glasses. So you might think that this picture here is the same curve as before, where this is including the uh, part, part, these partial sums of the connected replicas, and this is the area limit. But actually, this is a plot of the free energy versus temperature in spin glasses. So this is extremely reminiscent, uh, almost exactly, almost identical to uh, what we were seeing. We have this, this is the annealed free energy 
in, in, this, in the spin glasses. This is when you include correlated replicas, which are the analog of our replica wormholes. And they do make the situation better, but they don't resolve it entirely. In order to resolve this entirely, you have to have this very novel analytic continuation, the so-called Parisian nonsense, that involves multi-step breaking of this uh, permutation group replica symmetry of the, of the replicas that contribute to the free energy in the spin glass system. Now, I want to give a shout out to a very interesting paper by Clifford Johnson from last month, in which he computes the free energy in low temperature JT using the matrix model and using a sort of what he calls, I think, a replica double scale limit. And he finds that there is a well-behaved answer to this uh, that actually is monotonic in temperature all the way to T equals zero. And so that's a fully non-perturbative analysis, but it is also in the language of the matrix model. And so it seems to me that if we try to, that if, if we try to do this in the gravity picture, if we sort of understand how that translates into the gravity picture to give us the correct analytic continuation, we would learn a lot about how we actually are supposed to think about this and what, where does the correct analytic continuation come from and what it means. Let me just make one comment also on uh, another paper that, that talked about low energy effective field theory of SYK. So again, this is a, a study in a different language in a field theory, but um, they also found, so this group, these folks also found replica symmetry breaking, but it's sort of a different limit um, and it's not entirely clear if there is a connection or, uh, or what it is. So let me summarize and make a few comments about uh, where, where I think we're going with this and why it's interesting. So a little bit of overview. The, the recent developments on the black hole information paradox have suggested that Euclidean wormholes should be included in the gravitational path integral. And again, one way of interpreting this, certainly not the only one, is computing an ensemble average. Of course, I think the, the thing we really would like to understand is how general this statement is. Uh, in the sense, so how do we think about this in higher dimensions, for example? How do we think about this in terms of n equals four super yang mills? We'd also like to know how to calculate everything that the gravitational path integral computes without using the gravitational path integral as a black box. So maybe this is fanciful thinking, but I would like to do a minus trace row log row calculation that gives me the von Neumann entropy um, as computed by the gravitational path integral in terms of the uh, gravity theory. And all of this means we have to understand the gravitational path integral better. So what in, in this paper, we were interested in probing the replica wormhole phenomenon in the gravitational path integral, but looking at something which is more primitive than the von Neumann entropy. And you could say argue maybe contributes or has a signature on more observables, which is logs the in JT gravity, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but also in certain models, uh, certain truncated models of CGHS, we found that at sufficiently low temperatures, but not so low that the genus expansion is out of control, uh, the free energy without replica wormholes is very pathological. And in fact, you can actually show that the replica wormholes contribute more than the, um, the disconnected topologies. Now, it's also true that the, that the free energy is pathological with partial sum replica wormholes. Now, you could, you could say, I believe that if you take the full sum, the capital M goes to infinity limit, then this will be fine. But then you still have to contend with the fact that the analytic continuation to little m goes to zero is non-unique. And again, this, is, this non-uniqueness of the analytic continuation is very similar to spin glasses where there's a novel analytic continuation that removes the pathologies altogether. So a few words about the future. I think finding the correct analytic continuation seems pretty important. Now, this is where the spin glass analogy should help us, but unfortunately it's not quite sufficiently informative. To use the spin glass analogy in the Parisian sets, we have to work in a saddle point approximation, which is not something that we do in JT gravity. So it would look like we, what we need is a more complicated theory of gravity to do this. So this is again, another instance of the conservation of misery. So here's a wild speculation. I don't know if this is grounded in anything. Don't hold me to it, but just an opinion. I would like to know if there's a connection between averaging over theories in low dimensional gravity and coarse graining over microstates in higher dimensions. I don't know what the answer to that is. I think that people have speculated on this for quite some time. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing to look into. In particular, I think that the, uh, 
correct analytic continuation probably is some leftover signature from that kind of, from whatever happens in higher dimensions. And uh, finally, are there other regimes beyond low temperature where the replica wormholes can dominate the free energy? So with that, I will finish and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Netta, for the beautiful talk. Let's give her a round of applause. Are there any questions for Netta? Um, I, I, I have a, I have a go, question. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, sorry, uh, John. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what, if you don't think about replicas and wormholes and all, just in the, let's say this JT gravity setup or even simpler, some uh, Gaussian matrix model on the area limit. Uh, if you go to very low temperatures, the point is you're picking very atypical members of the ensemble that uh, have a lot of eigenvalues uh, near the bottom or even past the bottom. Yeah. And that gives you a, a large contribution to the free energy. It's those rare members of the ensemble that are uh, piling up and that that's what makes funny effects. Yeah, they're kind of overrepresented in this limit, you could say, and maybe they're washed out in other when you're looking at uh, at higher temperatures. Well, are they're not are there you pay a penalty to be in them and, yeah, exactly. and, uh, and yeah. you don't uh, get anything back. But shouldn't it be possible to do some, you know, simple analysis based on some density of eigenvalues about what happens at low temperature, like the density starts bunching up or something. And uh, uh, yeah, so we, we thought about that. Um, we, there, there were, you could say, oh, you could say various words about sort of the edge of the spectral form factor. Um, we didn't see anything that immediately explained. Well, you, I mean, you, you could say various words about the form, this, the spectral form factor. We didn't, we, I don't, I don't want to because we didn't actually see anything that would that was helpful for us. Um, I think so. Clifford Johnson had a, a very a very beautiful analysis where he basically just does this again purely from the matrix model perspective, right, and right. Um, and and there he finds a very simple answer. I think his free energy at, uh, goes. He, he can get an answer all the way to um, zero temperature, and I believe it goes something like minus t squared minus t. So it is uh, completely well behaved, but I don't believe, I, I might be wrong, but I don't believe there's a good explanation for why that is. Um, and what, what that corresponds to in particular in the gravitational theory in terms of correlated replicas. So maybe right. we were missing something and you can actually do a simple analysis, but um, we did not find it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so there's two questions. One is to figure out what the right answer of the matrix integral is, and the other one yeah. is to derive it from yeah. uh, from replicas. The gravitational gap. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks. Um, um, I have a related question. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. What, what was that? Um, uh, can you hear me well? Uh, I, I can just. Sorry, it's very, it keeps on cutting in and out. Um, try again. It's not just my connection, right? Can, yeah, could you, okay. could you ask the question again, Alexei? Maybe you can write it in the chat. Um, is this better now? No. No, sorry, Alexei. It's a little bit noisy. Maybe you could write your Just question in the, in the chat and, you'll, and I can you'll read it out. Do you mind if I ask a question while we sort that out, Nada? Go ahead. Um, so you, you mentioned very briefly that you were trying to think of how to do a, a lefkowitz maldacena style trick for the free energy. Yeah. Would you mind if I ask a question about that or is that too far afield of what you wanted to talk about today? Um, it's, it's, this project is in its infancy. I'm kind of embarrassed <laughs> that it's been in its infancy for a couple of months. But I'm going to blame the uh, I'm going to blame the pandemic on blame that. the pandemic. Good. Well, let me just ask. I you know it's obviously very um, suggestive that this would be something you would want to try. Mm -hmm. I, I thought a little bit about this, and the chief obstacle seems to be that for Lefkowitz Maldacena, because you are analytically continuing to near n equals one, 
you have a background space time that you can perturb off of. You know, yeah. near n equals one, you sort of approach your original space time. But if you're trying to do a similar trick for the free energy, you're trying to go towards m equals zero, where I guess what you're approaching is something like a null space time. Um, and for me, conceptually, that has been sort of, by, by null, I mean like the empty set, not null g in the sense of uh, geometry. I mean, you um, kind of, you're, you're perturbing essentially, I mean, you have to think about it in terms of the, the conical, conical deficit, you're essentially perturbing around an infinite conical deficit. And, infinite uh, conical deficit. I mean, you, you sort of have to think of this in terms of, if you think of the... Um, I see, okay, so instead of having, right, you'd have two pi over n in general. Yeah, so you're perturbing around an infinite conical deficit. Um, there are various ways of thinking about that. It, I mean, that is, of course, the chief obstacle, but uh, we're, we're sort of, I should say, we, this is with Alex Maloney and Sebastian Fischetti, we are uh, trying to get around that perturbing, basically working in this, um, in this picture where the infinite angle is being unwrapped. Uh, and we are, uh, we're perturbing around that um, using various defects. Um, it's, I, I'm very uncomfortable commenting on this because it's so early on in the project and everything I say now might end up being total nonsense in a couple of months. Okay, then I won't bug you anymore, but that was interesting. Thank you. We can talk about it offline if you want. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit more forthcoming. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think there was the question in the chat. Let me just open it. Um, I'm just going to take a minute to read this. Right, okay, can everybody see this or should I read it out loud? Everybody can see the, the question? Um, yeah, so, so I agree with that. I think if you were working at, uh, at much, much lower temperatures, then uh, certainly you would expect this to be a problem. But I think already, since you are working at low temperatures, you do expect that only a subset of the states are contributing, even though maybe it seems like a lot more than if you're working at strictly, you know, beta um, or TE to the S naught is approximately order one, as opposed to TE to the two S naught over three. Um, are there any other questions for Netta? Anything else in the chat? I don't think so. Okay, uh, if not, then uh, let's thank Netta again for the beautiful talk. Uh, it was a to be at Stanford. <laughs> oh, is that, is your background from Stanford there? Yeah, this is a virtual background. I wish I wish I were in my MIT office or at Stanford right now. All right, great. Uh, so I'll stop the recording.